Welcome everyone. My name is Jen Cavallari and I am an associate professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at UConn School of Medicine. I'm also the co-director at CPH New, the Center for the Promotion of Health in the New England Workplace, a NIOSH Center of Excellence for Total Worker Health. So welcome to our Total Worker Health Trends Export webinar series. We're excited today to have Gigi Petrie. And I wanted to give you a save the date for our next Trends webinar series, which will be on May 10th, when we'll be joined by Dr. Mazen El Ghaziri and Dr. Lisa Yeager to discuss evidence-informed resources to address worker stress and trauma. So be on the lookout for more information on how to register. So first I wanted to give you some information about CPH New, should you not already have it. So we're a center based out of UMass Lowell in the University of Connecticut. I encourage you to check out our website at www.uml.edu backslash CPH hyphen new. Uh, please, if you haven't already, follow us on social media, including Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube. In fact, a recording of this presentation will be made available on our YouTube channel, along with the previous Trends webinars. So now, without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Gigi Petrie here. Uh, Gigi Petrie is co-manager of the National Center for Productive Aging and Work, or NCPAW, at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, out of the CDC. She earned her master's and PhD in industrial organizational psychology, along with a graduate certificate in occupational health psychology, right here from the University of Connecticut, and we're glad she decided to join us again. She certainly is a friend of CPH New. Her research focuses on issues that are central to aging in an age diverse workforce, including workplace age stereotypes and age bias, successful aging at work, as well as worker health and well being. And today she'll be talking about supporting aging workers and overcoming workplace ageism. So with that, I will stop my sharing and give the screen in the floor to Dr. Petrie. Thanks, Gigi. I wanna thank you for that really kind introduction. And, and yes, I definitely am a, a good friend to CPH New. Um, and I'm so pleased to be invited to present in this webinar today. The primary aim of my presentation today is to educate you on ageism what it is, the various forms that it can take. And my hope is that you'll leave with a new awareness and you'll be able to recognize ageism as it's occurring both internally and externally, and also to give you some strategies for countering ageism. So I have a lot to cover. Um, and what uh, I, this is my agenda for today. So I'm gonna get, build a, a case of why you should care about ageism and then dive in what is ageism? What do I mean when I say that? What are some common ageist beliefs? We're gonna spend a, a little more time talking about generations because they're so popular uh, in, in the, the popular press these days. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap things up with some the better management approach and some strategies for you. Um, so just diving right in, why should you care? Well, the population is aging. This is a global phenomenon that's that's happening and it's, really touching uh, many countries, uh, most countries around the world, and, it, and this includes in the US. And because we have an aging population, we also have an aging workforce. And, and this also means that the workforce is more age diverse. We have a wider range of ages working side by side. You unfortunately likely have, or you likely will experience ageism at some point in your career. Um, there's some data to back this up. So from AARP uh, 2020, they surveyed uh, working adults age 45 to 65, 78% of them had said that they had either witnessed or experienced ageism at work. 
but ageism is not a phenomenon that's only experienced by older adults. Most of the data that we have um, really does focus on older adults. So uh, that will be a, a big focus of my presentation today, but it's not unique to older adults. Um, here's some data that shows a wider age uh, distribution. And this comes from the quality of work-life module of the General Social Survey uh, response to a question that asks, um, have you uh, experienced age discrimination in your job? And what we see here is a U-shaped distribution. So um, what that means is that people at the, the earlier stages of their working lives and then the, the later stages of their working lives, there's higher proportion of them that said that they have experienced ageism. And what you will notice here is actually at the younger age groups where people, there's a higher proportion that say that they experienced ageism. So what this illustrates to us is that ageism is not something that is unique just to older workers, that you really can experience it at any point in your career. But what do I mean when I say ageism? Well, ageism is a, is a type of a bias. And there are these three interrelated components of a bias. So one component is a cognitive component, and it's comprised of the different beliefs that we have about someone based on their membership to a particular group. In the, in the case of ageism, it's, say, older or younger workers. Um, and this is where stereotypes really have a strong influence in how we, um, we view people. There's a cognitive, I'm sorry, there's an um, effective component as well, which is this overall evaluation of an individual, or more simplistically, it's this, the positive or negative feelings that we have towards a person that are based on their group membership. And it's these feelings that prejudice how we view and, and how we behave towards others. And then there's the behavioral component, which is how we treat people based on their group membership. And this is where discrimination happens. There's, there's two forms that bias can take. Uh, one is explicit bias, and this is where you're consciously aware of these, of these attitudes or these biases that you have towards a certain group. Um, and so this is where we would have over ages and people are consciously aware that they have these negative views and they'll, they'll behave in such a way. But then there's this implicit bias. And this is unconscious, so meaning that you're not aware that you actually have bias feelings towards a certain group. And it manifests really as a positive or negative preference for a particular group based on subconscious thoughts. Now, both Explicit and implicit bias can produce discriminatory behaviors. However, when you have implicit bias happening, the individual may not be aware that it's biases rather than what's going on in that moment that are actually influencing how they're behaving. So how might this work in, in an actual workplace setting? I'll use an example of older workers. Um, so you may have some beliefs some stereotypes about older workers in general, which will prejudice the, um, the way that you feel about older workers. And so when you encounter older workers, you may discriminate against them. Now this process could also happen with younger workers, um, but we tend to think about discrimination from a legal standpoint. And in the US, our federal age discrimination laws are for people that are age 40 and over. So it's a little bit harder to show discrimination per se with, with younger people because of that. But it doesn't mean that people aren't perceiving it happening. And in fact, there's a number of different workplace situations where, where um, people can perceive ageism is occurring. This is data from Society of Human Resource Management and they asked workers of a wide age range um, and, and if they had experience or they perceived ageism occurring in these different work situations. And you can see that actually, there's a pretty high proportion of people that said that, yes, they, they had experienced this ageism in these different settings. Again, I think it's really interesting to note that it's the younger age groups that have the highest proportion there. Um, and uh, with the oldest age group, we see it more so on the job promotion opportunities. We may not see it quite as much with them on the um, job application, uh, uh, aspect because these are people that were already employed. So um, they they may have been, there may have been a bias in that data because uh, they, they already were employed. 
um, related to uh, to ageism or to these biases is also something that's known as microaggressions. And I, I felt this is worth mentioning. I've been seeing this pop up a lot, a lot of conversations around microaggressions. So um, what a microaggression is, it's a comment or action that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudiced attitude towards a member of a marginalized group. Now, um, these microaggressions, they are, they're usually in the form of an offhanded comment that the, the person is, they, they feel it's intended to be a compliment or maybe a joke, um, but for the person receiving that, hearing it, they're, they're, that's not how they experience it. So here's a few examples for you. You look good for your age. Or how about, you're too young to understand. Or you're so hardworking for your age. Or in making some sort of comment to an older worker about uh, them being incapable or uninterested in learning new technology. So something like, oh, well, you know, I'll handle the technology in the meeting because I know that technology is a challenge for, for older people. Things like that. Um, so what these microaggressions do, these comments, these actions, they remind the target of their otherness, that they are not really uh, part of the group. Now, I want to pause for just a second because I think I've just bombarded you with a whole bunch of information and you may be, um, I don't know, hurting. Your head might be hurting like this woman here. So I, I want to just uh, normalize biases for just a second. Uh, we all have biases. We actually can't survive without biases. If you're human, then you have biases. So they're, they're, they are completely normal. Um, you can have a bias about anything. It could be about a person, place, or a thing. And the biases are not all negative, that you can have a positive bias, and they can be fueled by stereotypes or antidotal evidence. So, um, so an example is I grew up in Southern California, and I would say in and out burgers are the best fast food burgers that exist. So I, because I've eaten a whole bunch of um, in and out burgers in my life. So I'm biased about them. Uh, having a biased belief does not mean that you're a bad person. Again, we all have biased beliefs. They, and a lot of these are automatic. We can't, um, we can't really control our thoughts. But just because you have biased thoughts doesn't necessarily mean that they have to lead to biased behaviors. You have control, you have autonomy over how you behave. And um, related most here towards ageism is that some biases are more socially accepted than others. And sadly, uh, ageism is one of those biases. Now, if you want to learn more about uh, potential implicit biases that you may have, um, you can uh, check out the implicit bias tests that are available. These were developed by researchers at Harvard University. And um, there's 15 different tests that are available on a whole bunch of different topics. So age, gender, uh, race, religion, sexual orientation are just a few. And the link will be in the slides, which you can download. Um, I believe they're available on the website. Okay, so now that we've covered that, let's, let's continue on. Um, so actually, Ages beliefs, there's there's a, a whole variety of them that exist out there. And I'm gonna touch on a number of them. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time in this area. Uh, and we get these ages beliefs, we get reinforced from this from a variety of sources around us all the time. Uh, they're they're on the news, on on um on different programs that we watch on TV. You may see them in fairy tales and stories that we read as children. They're in the news. Uh, they're in popular press, nonfiction, fiction. Um, they, and they're, they may even be uh, promoted in college courses that are taught without people being aware that they're, that they're actually promoting these ages beliefs. So, um, so let's, let's take a look at a few of these. First one I want to talk about comes from the economists, and it's known as the depreciation model. And it's really based on the perceived value of a worker at various uh, stages of their career. And it looks something like this. And uh, so what it shows is that when you are at the early stages of your career and really at the later stages of your career, your value is perceived as low. But when you're at the 
early stages of your career, you have a lot of potential. You, you're going to be learning a lot and, um, and you're going to be able to really give good value to the organization as time pro progresses. You're going to, it's just an upward trajectory for you. And in the mid-career, you have consistently high value, perceived consistently high value for that organization. You're going to perform at a high standard and you're, you are in your prime. But once you start getting towards the later part of your career, then the, the perception is that your value is going to be declining, that the cost associated with, um, with employing you is going to outweigh the performance that is really expected to be declining um, as you get older. So you become um, not a good asset. You're not, you're risky to have employed. Stereotypes really fuel all of these uh, biases here. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into stereotypes. So what a stereotype is, it's a oversimplified generalization about a group of people. And we all rely on stereotypes to process information. So stereotypes, again, remember they inform our biases. And at any given period of time, we are, we have about, you know, two, three, four million bits of information that are um, available to us in our environment, but yet we're only able to cognitively process about 40 or 50 pieces of information. So that's a lot that we can't, we just can't cognitively attend to. Our brains just aren't able to, to process it. So we use stereotypes as a cognitive shortcut to help us make these quick evaluations. Stereotypes can be positive or negative. And um, they can take different forms. So one that we, the type, one form that we think of most commonly is, is a, what's called a descriptive stereotype. And this describes the way that we believe people are. So older workers are wise. That would be a descriptive. There's also prescriptive stereotypes. And these are beliefs about how people should behave. So one would be older workers should retire to make way for younger workers. Um, now, stereotypes can vary by culture. They're not the same all over the world. Um, and they can also vary based on where you live, where you work. And um, this last point is the most discouraging for me. And that is that uh, stereotypes, are they're common, they're widespread, and they tend to endure across time, despite having overwhelming evidence that contradicts those stereotypes. And we see this happening with generational stereotypes as well, which are really, um, uh, there's a lot of overlap between those and age stereotypes. Some other forms of stereotypes that exist out there, uh, there's one that's called meta-stereotypes. And this is what you think are the stereotype beliefs others have about your group. So this is what I think everybody, what all of you out there think about older workers. And, and if you think that about older workers, you may think that about me. And um, and this becomes very threatening, and it actually may uh, inadvertently cause me to behave in a way that confirms those stereotypes to you. Another um, another form is self stereotyping, and this is when you view your group's stereotype traits as descriptive of yourself. So this is saying, well, you know, um, I I understand that older workers they're not good with technology and I'm an older worker and uh, you know, I've struggled with technology and you know, maybe it's just not even worth putting any effort in because I, I can't learn it anyway. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, generations, again, these are the, the closely aligned, the stereotypes with generations are closely aligned with age. Um, but I want to spend a little bit more time delving into generations because this is so pervasive in our society right now. Um, so generations is a concept that originated in the field of sociology back in the 1950s. Um, and it really wasn't meant to be a way of, you know, oh, this is the way we should manage people. Um, it was really just saying, oh, well, a group of people that are born during a similar period of time, they may have some similar life experiences during their formative years. But this idea was, was picked up by, uh, by, the, by people that write um, workforce management guidebooks and what have you about 20, 25 years ago. And it has just taken off. Uh, so we've all seen books and blogs and 
all kinds of things about, you know, how do you manage to the to the baby boomers? How do you manage to the millennials, right? Um, so I'm just kind of curious. I want to uh, launch a poll. Let's see if I can do this. Launch. Um, which generation do you belong to? I'm 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 curious who we have in the house. Oh, this is great. I see those numbers ticking up. Okay. I'll give it three more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the poll just because I um of time because I, I am long-winded today. So we have a we have a pretty good representation of different generations here. Um and just a couple of people who said that they don't believe in generations. So this is this is great. Um so let me stop that and and this will become apparent while I asked you that in a minute. Um, okay, so then we have the idea of generational differences. And what do we mean by this? So here's a new vocabulary word for you, and it's generationalism. Say that one three times fast. Uh, and it's the belief that all members of a given generation possess characteristics specific to that generation, especially so as to distinguish it as inferior or superior to another generation. And we see this in society all over the place, all, all over the place. Um, and there's anecdotal evidence of it all, all over the place as well. Um, you know, you just see somebody that kind of conforms to these, the stereotyped um, generational uh, traits and you're like, oh, there, there's another boomer, right? Um, people have a vested interest in these generational differences. So we saw from the poll results that you all identify with these generations. You know, there's there's something meaningful to these. But beyond just our own personal beliefs, there's a lot of money to be made in this. So we see this at conferences. There may be whole conferences that are devoted to this idea of generationalism, managing to different generations, um, and sessions at, at conferences. We see it in the popular press all of the time. I see it all the time. I'm just aware of it, I guess. And social media, again, the OK Boomer uh, tag that was has been so popular over the last few years. Um, business schools may actually uh, in, in, uh, interject this idea of generational differences in their coursework, or maybe even have whole courses on this. Training programs are devoted to this. Consulting practices may be built around this idea, and there's a real appeal to this. So it's it's accessible, it's digestible, it helps us make sense of our society and how we fit into our society, and it feeds our desire to be unique and belong somewhere. So we have my generation, this, they're, they're my people, and then there's there's them, there's, there's those other generations out there. There's a whole slew of problems that go along with this idea of generational thinking, and I'm going to keep hammering this this nail of all the problems. Um, so the first is this idea of this us versus them. And really what this is fostering is this in-group, out-group, or social categorization. And when we do this, we look at our in-group members in a more favorable way. Those that are in my generation, I have a positive bias, bias towards them. And I recognize the unique qualities of each person in, in my group. Now, with the other group, with this out group, those other generations, well, we tend to view them much more critically and we define them more by their stereotypes and we don't recognize their individual uh, qualities. But it doesn't stop there. The idea of generational thinking, it, it only really considers the historic influences during your younger formative years. And it assumes that those influences uh, they influence everybody in that cohort, that generational cohort, in the same way. It doesn't even consider that other people that are alive may have also experienced these, these different events, and it may have also had an influence on their lives. So just think about 9-11, uh, and it, this is supposed to be a really um, formative event for millennials, but anybody that was alive at that time, it was a very uh, influential event in all of our lives. 
Um, it assumes that the generation characteristics, they apply to everybody in that generational cohort. So all the stereotypes really apply to everybody that are in that, that group. And it fails to take into account that there's individual difference. There's individual variability and that, and that that changes as we age. So this is kind of a way of, of thinking about it. When we're born, when we're babies, we're a lot more similar to one another, but as we get older um, and across time, we have different experiences. We have different things happening in our lives. So we become more uh, individualized, more different from one another. And, and it's, so it's really hard to apply these labels in very broad terms saying that, you know, everybody is like this because there's doesn't take into account those individual differences. Um, in terms of in the workplace, this idea of generational thinking has had a real strong influence in the way that leaders think about their policies and practices and, and, and managing to these different generations, which unfortunately may unintentionally uh, promote ageism in the workplace. And also this idea of generationalism can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if you tell a group of people long enough, oh, your generation is lazy and entitled and they identify with that generation, you know, they may begin to question themselves and say, well, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I am, maybe my generation is lazy and entitled. Maybe I am lazy and entitled. And they may begin to behave that way unintentionally. Um, from a, a methodological and statistical uh, standpoint, when we're doing research on generations, um, there are considerable methodological and statistical challenges that exist, trying to disentangle these three separate but interrelated um, components that make up a generation. So there's the age component. So these are variations associated with aging that are attributable, attributable to life stage and maturity, period variations. These are associated with specific historic events at a given period of time. And then there's the cohort, which is really how we think about generations as more as this cohort. And it's variations associated with groups of people based on their shared experiences. So when we see information being reported out about these generational differences in the media you know, through different national polls that have occurred or even in research studies, I can almost guarantee you that they haven't applied the uh, statistical rigor to those um, to that data to try and disentangle and isolate what are those um, what are those cohort uh, factors there. And really, so when we're seeing that data being presented, what um, what we're just as likely or maybe even more likely to be attributing these differences to is age of the individual when the study was conducted or the period of time when the data was collected or somehow all these things are interrelated. But it isn't so much, we can't say that it, these are generation effects because we haven't really isolated that that's to say that that's what it is. And the National Academy of Science uh, really took up this issue a few years ago, and they assembled a, a group of leading scholars and asked them to really examine um, this, this idea of generational differences. And does it make sense to um, use these as, as a strategy for managing em employees and the workforce? And, and so they reviewed the 30 plus years of, of studies that have been done and data and um, over 500 studies that they, they looked at. And they reached a number of conclusions. And I encourage you to download a copy of this um, report. It's available for free, a digital copy is available for free from the website. There's the URL for it. And I'm gonna share just two of the conclusions um, that they came up with here because I think they're, they're pretty compelling. It says many of the research findings that have been attributed to generational differences may actually reflect shifting characteristics of work more generally or variations among people as they age and gain experience. And then the other one is many of the stereotypes about generations result from imprecise use of terminology in the popular literature and recent research and thus cannot adequately inform workplace uh, management decisions. Furthermore, characterizing a group of workers by observable attributes can lead to overgeneralizations 
and improper assumptions about those workers and perhaps even discrimination. Um, now, I, I have shared this information a, a number of times in different presentations, and I know people are really confronted by this, this information because we do, like I said, we're, we're pretty invested in the idea of our generations. Um, but I hope I've at least given you some, some pause and, um, and you'll dig in and, and look, at, look at the evidence that exists. Take a look at this report, take a look at some of the other uh, work in the literature. And, and I hope that you'll, it'll start to chip away at your um, belief if you have a belief in the idea of generations. And, and I'm gonna move on from generations now, but I, I really wanted to take some time to talk about these because they are so prevalent in our society. Um, okay, I have another poll for you. I'm going back to the idea of these different age um, uh, stereotypes about older workers in particular. I'm gonna um, ask this question twice. So the first one is, which of these work-related behaviors and attitudes do you think tends to get worse with age? I'm gonna ask the same question um, about what gets better so you'll have opportunity to answer both ways. Um, and you can answer with as many as you want. It's multiple, choose as many as you want. Um, not You're not limited to one. It shouldn't be limited to one. Um, and don't And don't be, you know, we're all we're amongst friends here and the responses are anonymous. So see the numbers ticking up. Give it just a few more few more seconds. Waiting to reach about 50 people. Okay, 47. 48, 50. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Um, and I'll share the results in a in a in a minute. Um, okay, so now um let me advance this again. And these are the same, the same different um behaviors and attitudes. What do you think improves as people get older? Woo. I love seeing the, the numbers popping up there. This is, thank you for playing along. Okay, and I'll give it maybe just three more seconds. Okay, and now I'm going to end the poll. And uh, let me go back. I'll um, I'll share the results in in just a minute. I want to show you what the data. Well, maybe I'll share the results before I show you what the data say. Um, okay, so this is this is what people. Here um, of the 50 respondents that I had, um, what they think the uh, gets worse with age, um, resistance to change, which isn't surprising, that is uh, one of the, the, the strongestly endorsed um, stereotypes about older workers um, that, that there is. And uh, interesting safety performance. So interesting. Okay. And um, Let's take a look at what we think gets better with age. So um, poor job performance there, organizational commitment. Um, sounds like we've got some people that know know their stuff here. So this is this is great. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to show you what um, what the empirical data actually say about this. So, um, so the, the first one is with core job performance, training performance and creativity, there is no empirical relationship with age on these. So, um, and that is surprising for some people, but you girl, you're all a bunch of smart folks out there. So you, 
you're not influenced by those stereotypes. Um, and then all those other things that were there and a few more thrown in for good measure, they actually tend to improve with age. And, and I'll just point out that these are all uh, qualities and characteristics that are highly desirable for employers. Um, so, you know, could it be that that older workers are a, um, a, a key demographic group to target when we're trying to uh, look for ways to um, uh, find workers? When we, you know, we see that there's a shortage of workers, employers are having a hard time finding workers. So maybe maybe this is a great target population um, to look at. Um, so what are the ramifications of workplace ageism? What, what, what harm does it do? Well, it really hits at, at all different levels of society. So really at that highest level, um, with just in the, the US, um, some economists did some great number crunching and looked at 2018 data. What they estimated is that the US economy lost or missed out on $850 billion from missed opportunities. And what do I mean by that? I'm talking about in, involuntary retirement due to lack of opportunities or a hostile work environment, underemployment of qualified older workers, and duration of unemployment. Um, and it also costs the healthcare system. There's, I mean, we'll see in a second that there's, there's health costs for individuals and people seek out um, healthcare for the, their experiences that are associated with ageism and estimated to cost the US healthcare system $63 billion in just a single year. Organizations also suffer uh, by, by in, encouraging or not squelching ageism in their workplace. So first off, um, if you're an older worker and you feel like you've been discriminated against because of your age in the workplace, you can file a, a, an EEOC age discrimination claim. And this data, I can't remember if it was from 2020 or 2021, but EEOC awarded out $76 million in age discrimination claims for a single year. Um, but organizations also miss out on opportunities from all their employees. This is not, not just older workers. So this, again, this data is really about, it's driven by older workers. I don't know so much what happens with younger workers, but with older workers, um, it, but it affects everybody in the workplace. So what do I mean by missed opportunities? Decreased organizational productivity, not individual, but at the organizational level. Uh, reduced employee engagement, organizational commitment and job satisfaction, a worsening of intergroup relations, and um, an increased in counterproductive work behavior. And then for individuals, they will have, uh, they'll suffer their physical health, their mental health will suffer, and they also will have a reduced occupational self-efficacy, so they won't feel as confident and capable in their jobs. They have reduced sense of belonging and uh, social motivations. Now, there, there is a better management approach that we can take to this. Um, so first off, instead of thinking about generations, why don't we think about age in the workplace from a lifespan perspective? So recognizing that workers' needs, wants, and motives may vary over time. And these are often influenced by life circumstances and various career stages that we are at. Um, we can use better terminology. We really do not have to use these generational labels. And I um, strongly encourage people to stop using them. I don't care how convenient they are, but they are harmful. They're, again, they're, they can be a form of microaggression just by using the word. So some uh, better terminology could be early career, mid-career, late career, younger workers, older workers, middle-aged workers. Um, those are all um, alternatives that we can use. And then, um, in organizations, think about promoting an age-inclusive workplace. So a lot of the diversity, inclusion, and equity initiatives, um, uh, actually majority of them don't explicitly include age in them. So this, this is one step. You can show that age is something, it's, it's a, a, quality, a diverse quality that is valued. And then also make efforts to promote an age-inclusive work practices. Um, so this is um, irrespective of age, equally fostering opportunities for employees to, to gain knowledge, skills, and use their abilities, 
recognizing motives and efforts of people at all different ages and providing people opportunities to contribute regardless of their age. Now, age-inclusive age workplace policies and practices, that's not like this is our age-inclusive policy. It actually can touch in a whole variety of different policies and practices that exist. And uh, Boehm et al. in 2021 published this paper where they talk about all these different um, types of policies and practices and how they can be more age inclusive. So there's a URL there for that paper that you can also download and take a look at if you wanna know more about that. Um, so um, I'll end this with some strategies for countering bias beliefs and promoting inclusion. So the first one is to facilitate contact and communication among people of different ages. And what you'll discover, so we, what we tend to do is we tend to associate with people that are most similar to us. And so that may be people of the same age group. But if you start making efforts to connect and, and talk to people of other ages, you may actually discover that you have more things in common than you originally thought, and you'll make new personal connections. Um, seek opportunities to work collaboratively with people of different ages. There is um, a really uh, robust uh, research field that has looked at um, reducing biases, ways to reduce bias. And what they have found is that when you have people that are, they don't have power differentials, but they are interdependent upon each other to work towards a shared goal, to achieve a shared goal, then that can actually reduce the bias. They stop seeing each other based on those, the stereotypes that are associated with their group. And they start seeing each other as individuals. Look for opportunities to do um, not only mentorship where you have a, a, a veteran um, that is uh, taking a younger person under their wing to you know, share knowledge, um, train them, but also look, you can do the opposite of doing reverse mentorship where you have maybe uh, someone who's newer, younger, and they have all kinds of knowledge and skills that they can also share with the more seasoned veterans. So really take advantage of, of the knowledge that everybody has and work and, and share it amongst one another. Um, and then also the last thing would be, be aware of biased beliefs that you may have. Be aware when you have an instantaneous um, reaction towards an individual and then think about, you know, are there is there other information that is available that is that's counter to that initial knee-jerk reaction that you have. And remember that just because you have those, those beliefs, it doesn't mean that they have to translate into behaviors. You actually have a lot of autonomy over how you behave towards other people. Uh, I just wanna quickly go over to my contact information. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to look at all the chats, I will do that. Afterwards, um, I put my contact information up here. I'd love to hear from you and uh, continue the conversation. This is a, a, a really important topic that affects all of us and it's ripe for more research. So I hope do good, get out there and do more aging research. 